Welcome to the Indiana 4-H Clover Call Podcast, where our goal is to share information about the people and programs that make the Indiana 4-H Youth Development Program such an important part of our communities. We welcome youth and adult 4-H volunteers, 4-H youth and their families, extension professionals, and any others who are interested in providing positive opportunities for youth. We thank you for joining us for this episode, which begins now. Hi, my name is Kathleen Bodie. I'm the 4-H educator in Hamilton County, and welcome to Clover Call Podcast. We are so excited here today to have two youth that have received a YES grant from the Indiana 4-H Foundation. And YES grant stands for Youth Engaged in Service. So I look forward to hearing about your projects today and more of, of what you all have impacted your local community. So Mackenzie, could you introduce yourself and um, just start us off? Hi, my name is Mackenzie Schneider. I am a senior at Monrovia High School, and I've been in 4-H for about eight years now doing various indoor projects, community service things, their junior leaders, and showing my dog Ellie in the Morgan County Canine Crusaders. Awesome. All right. And Alice. Hi, my name is Alice Pickett. I go to Short Ridge High School in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I've been in 4-H for about eight years now. This is going to be my ninth year. I show chickens, llamas, and just recently pocket pets. And I love doing service in 4-H and also doing basic craft and fine arts. Yeah, I think you guys are just great examples of the variety that 4-H has to offer our um, youth here in Indiana. And we are today really kind of going to focus about your service learning opportunities that 4-H has brought to you. So if one of you would like to start with um, what your cause was and how you um, came about picking that cause. I can go first. Um, So the YES grant that I received was used towards a project that I've kind of combined with my Girl Scout project. So I've been in Girl Scouts for 12 years and there are three main awards. So I have worked my way up to the last award. It's the Gold Award, which about less than 5% Girl Scouts earn. And so I've combined that with my 4-H YES grant project and my Change Makers program. And I have basically revamped and then added a agility course to the Jimmy Nash City Park in Martinsville, Indiana. Um, So this project was estimated to cost about $10,000. So the YES grant was a big help in my fundraising for that. And it's really going to allow the community a place to go and bond with their like dogs and then like exercise, get out in the sun, have some playtime, and then really just bond with other dogs in other communities, um, other people in the community. And then I also feel like this is a great opportunity for the Humane Society and the local dog rescues in my community because they are able to go and have adoption events and people are able to go out and meet the dogs and actually see the dogs in a more like normal situation and not in a dog cage so they can actually get to know them. Wow, very cool. And Alice? So I also combined the YES grant with with something that I was already doing in my community. So during COVID, I started the Lost Arts Club as a way to connect my peers with service because a lot of the service opportunities were canceled due to COVID. And I thought that was a real shame. So I, we did virtual service projects like using calligraphy to write letters to soldiers overseas. So the club is called the Lost Arts Club, and we take lost arts, which are like skills that aren't taught in schools, and they're based on fine arts and basic crafts in 4-H. So like I said, we learned calligraphy, and then we also learned origami and gave it to our teachers during COVID because it was a hard time. And when we went in person, I knew that I wanted to have something more tangible that would really affect our community, Indianapolis. And I came up with the um, HVAAF, which is the Helping Veterans and Families Association, which is in Indianapolis. And then I was like, okay, so how can I fund this? Because obviously we didn't have any funding at that point. So I brainstormed what projects could we do or fund that we could 
have the club members learn a new skill that they could carry on into their future and instill a passion for service within them. And I called up the association and I was like, hey, um, I'm looking to do a project in the fall and winter. What kind of items would you need? And they said blankets and scarves and socks and things to keep the veterans warm would really help. And then I found the YES grant and I was like, wow, this is perfect. Um, so then I read up, wrote up the report and I made the timeline so that we could do tie blankets for the veterans and also crochet handmade scarves. That's awesome. I love how both of these examples have um, been in other, organ other organizations were also pulled in and you were able to utilize this 4-H opportunity in different ways. And um, these are just great examples. I can't wait to, to learn more here through our conversation. Um, as always, you know, we dream big with our ideas or that. So what, um, I mean, when you talk about $10,000, like, woo, like what are maybe some other funding sources or how did you get to that big vision for this um, service learning project? Um, so I actually did present to a lot of like smaller organizations like the VFW and the Lions Club and things like that. And I did presentations asking for sponsorships and just basically telling people how they can help because my community is always wanting to get involved with everything they can involved with. So I feel like this was a great way for them to get involved. And I also hosted a benefit dinner. So we had fun, like use previous fundraising money and we threw a big dinner and people came and we had fun. We had like a picture booth with your inner, like people and their dogs take photos with. And we've raised a lot of money through that. And then I also hosted a Bark in the Park dog walk. So we were at the Jimmy Nash City Park. So people could kind of just see what was there because I've met a lot of people that didn't even know we had a dog park in Morgan County and I for the longest time did not either. So this was also a great opportunity to raise money, people to bond with their dog, to see what the dog park has the potential to be. And I just see that we actually have a dog park and that it needs help. Yeah, that's a great um, idea about just awareness. And um, as Alice, you were talking about awareness of the lost arts, like how um, did you get the buy-in of your um, fellow classmates at your school to go along with this project and, and motivate others that hadn't seen your vision yet? Well, this the way I started the club was in COVID. And since there wasn't a lot of opportunities for involvement, um, a lot of people really wanted to be involved. Um, and then this year we were able to put up flyers and kind of just the word of mouth, mouth spread. And it was just nice to have people bond over the service because we held the meetings here at Short Ridge. So after school people could, while they were crocheting their scarves or tying their tie blankets, they could talk with the other students. And really it was just an overall great way to better their academic life and enrich it. Um, just overall, um, I think people just want it to be involved and giving yes. them that opportunity. Yeah, people really want to be involved in a, a great cause and I can see and hear the passion of both these projects. Um, but sometimes things don't always work out or that. What is maybe a, a challenge or that that you may have had to overcome, Mackenzie, with this project and, and getting it off the ground and, and getting it to where you have it? When I first planned my project, I knew I wanted my equipment to be very sustainable and to be long lasting. I don't want it going anywhere and anytime soon. And so I had researched a lot of companies online and all of the prices for this equipment, like my grand total would be anywhere from like 15,000 to 20,000. And that's just for the equipment. Like that's not including benches or mulch and rocks to make everything look nice. So I was really in the struggle vest, especially with COVID because it's the hardest time to fundraise and ask people for money because everyone's not doing well financially, all the small businesses. It was really like really a struggle. And then I had been talking with some friends and family and I actually found a local fabrication shop where I was able to work with them and kind of design my own versions of these equipment. And they were able to make that for me at about a fourth of the cost. So they made all the metal bases and then my family and I had got the lumber and we cut it and we painted it and we were able to put the rest together. So that was able to save us a lot of money. And that was definitely one of the bigger things I had to overcome. 
Yeah, that wow, that's finding a, a great business that helps helps out and cost savings and including that family for that some good free labor there. That's all, all, always good on these projects. What about you, Alice? What may have been a challenge that when you were implementing this program you had, hadn't thought about and, and how you overcame it? Yeah, I was also going to talk about the financial finances. Um, and the yes grant definitely helps with that because you can come up with these great service ideas, but it's really hard to fund it sometimes, especially during COVID. Um, and then another kind of trouble was since we are all the members were learning a new skill, um, crocheting, I was a little bit worried we weren't, we weren't going to finish it in time because I wanted to donate it around Christmas time because we also hand wrapped all of the blankets and all the scarves just to give it that more human touch to know that the veterans that there's somebody there who cares about them and who loves them. Um, but all of the club members really came through. Uh, a lot of them took, took it home and worked on it at home, which was really great to see. Um, people always want to help out. And I think that giving people the opportunity to, they'll always come through. Yeah, so true. So what has been the impact of these programs on your local community? Well, obviously my local community, this is a public park. So anyone and their dog, they're welcome to go. You can, it's a great bonding. So this is the, really the reason behind I got behind this project is from the Morgan County Dog Club where I've shown my dog through 4-H. And it's truly an amazing bond that I've personally had. And I know so many of the other dog and owner pairs have had through showing your dog because your dog really puts all their trust into them when they're doing agility. And I knew that this is something I really wanted to share with my community. So obviously the opportunity to get that bond, um, the community has the great resource to use it for adoption events. And I feel like if people have this resource sitting right in their backyard, they'd be more likely to go and adopt a dog. If they live in an apartment with no yard, oh, like where am I supposed to take this? Take it to the dog park. It's a great resource. It's also really affected our 4-H community, especially the dog club, because um, they are able to go and they're able to practice there. We're only really able to practice for about two hours once a week from like March to the fair, which is not a lot of time when you're thinking of 40 to 50 kids and their dogs. So this is a great resource for that. And then personally, I love the opportunity to go and have fun with my dog and just have other, like, meet other people that care and have their passion about dogs also. Yeah, awesome. So the impact that my project had is there's about 120,000 homeless individuals um, this year. And we personally um, hand delivered all of our donations to the association. And we saw where they were putting it. We saw we met some of the veterans there. Um, and it was really great to see where the service was going, which is something that as not a leader of the service project, as like maybe just a helper or a participator that you usually don't get to see. And um, I felt that that was really impactful. Uh, and then also a lot of the students here at Shortridge may not have the resources or the opportunities to learn some of these lost arts like calligraphy or crocheting. Um, and that's something that they can take into their life after charge and after this project is over and continue to expand their creativity. And also I felt that it had an impact on a passion for service in Shortridge. I love that both of your projects are not only doing good for your community, but also those that are involved. Your youth that are you know, able to go to the dog park and, and use it with our own dogs as well. And Alice, you're saying like they're learning their, their skills that they will keep on going on for life as well. And that's just a win-win situation when service learning can um, help us grow and stretch and provide those resources. And um, like I said, this YES grant was provided by the Indiana 4 H Foundation and their uh, vision and goal is to provide um, opportunities for youth to take the lead in making their own communities a better place. And the YES grants were intended to give youth-led projects the financial boost that they need to get off the ground and start making a difference. And it sounds like you guys' projects were great examples of that. And in a time where um, yeah, we were in starting in COVID and now as we come out of it, you have really um, 
bless your community with these projects and continue on. Um, because this podcast is called um, Clover Call, what is your next Clover Call to action with these projects? Or are you exploring another service learning opportunity? I feel like there's always more that you can add to a dog park. So I will definitely continue keeping this in whatever I can do to make it bigger and better. I know I am, my next step is really adding um, a mural to thank our sponsors at the dog park. So I think that's kind of the next call I have for this dog park, but really just keeping the dog park well kept, keeping people at the dog park, making more people aware and then I would really like to get more adoption events held there also. So I think my next Clover call will obviously be continuing the Lost Arts Club. We're currently working on a mural within our school um, that is focused around feminism and supporting the LGBTQ community. Um, and I hope to next year and at the end of this year do some fundraising within the school. So that hopefully next year we can do um, more projects and help to impact our community. And I've definitely seen, even within the club, they, a lot of the members have ideas for service that they wanna do. And it's really inspiring to see not only myself get more of a Clover call, but also to see them have that call to service too. Oh, well, I just appreciate you guys sharing today um, your stories and your, um, in your true calling of the service learning projects. And just thank you for applying for these grants, helping find, find some under, um, underwriting funds as, um, as we are able to, to help more um, with other grant opportunities. We, we hope that you also utilize the Indian 4 H Foundation for other grant opportunities, but truly just thank you for sharing your story today. And you guys really are change makers here in the 4 H program. And so appreciate you sharing your story today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. And I really hope that a lot of people listening um, they start thinking of service projects that they can do within their own community now that they have access to the YES grant. We just heard from our great youth of Indiana 4-H about their projects of making um, YES grant applications and me awarding those programs. And I just thought it'd be great to have us learn a little bit more about the Indiana 4-H Foundation. And so I have asked Shelly Bingle from the executive director of the Indiana 4-H Foundation to join us on this podcast to tell us more about the foundation and how we might be able to help support these youth just like the ones we just heard from. Thanks Kathleen. The Indiana 4-H Foundation is a nonprofit organization and we provide financial support and manage endowments for 4-H youth development across the state. It receives funding from individuals, corporations, and through the sales of the Indiana 4-H license plate, which also benefit Indiana 4-H programs in each county where the plates are sold. In 2021, the foundation provided over $500,000 in 4-H program and scholarships in all 92 counties in Indiana. The foundation board of directors is so grateful to the NOLA Gentry Charitable Trust and to Corteva AgriScience for providing the funds for the YES grants. In 2021, 16 YES grants um, were given out, totaling $14,900 in funding. You can learn more at our website at www.in4h.org. Thanks so much. Thank you, Shelly, for coming on today to tell us a little bit more about the foundation. And have a great rest of your day on this Clover Call podcast. Interested in learning more about Indiana 4-H? We invite you to visit our website, extension.purdue.edu slash 4-H, or contact your local Purdue Extension office and ask for the 4-H Youth Development Extension Educator. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you won't miss an episode. We look forward to joining you again on the next Indiana 4-H Clover Call.